So good morning, everyone. Uh, I want to welcome everyone um, to the Donald Wharton Visiting Professorship. It's the first time in two years we've been together in this room. Uh, and it, it's nice to see everyone. Uh, it's also nice to still have the connection to Zoom for others who can't get here in person. Um, this is a, a, a significant event. Uh, very briefly, um, about Dr. Morton. Um, Dr. Morton's visiting professorship in surgical oncology honors one of the most respected surgeons in the country. Dr. Morton was raised in the coal fields of West Virginia before going to Berea College, UC Berkeley, UCSF, uh, and then um, uh, became a, a force in surgical oncology and a leader in, in many trials. Uh, a sentinel node to be most specific about the driver behind those things. Uh, we recognize him for uh, his beginnings here in West Virginia and all that he has done uh, and to help to recognize the, the value of the state of West Virginia. Our visiting professor this year is uh, E. Phillips Pollock. Uh, Dr. Pollock uh, has been a long uh, friend and supporter of not only the Department of Surgery and the university, but of this residency. Uh, it has been uh, a pleasure to get to know him over the last seven years. Uh, we will uh, really appreciate uh, what he has to say a bit about Dr. Pollock. Uh, he's from Wheeling, uh, I think forever. Um, he graduated, was graduated from Bethany College a long time ago. Uh, and received his medical degree here at West Virginia University. Uh, from there, he went on to uh, Boston University for general surgery residency, and then to Duke University for uh, plastic surgery. Um, he's got an honorary doctorate from Bethany College and one of the youngest ever to do so. And I'm gonna venture you were 30, 32 or so when that happened. Uh, Lifetime Achievement Award from that college. Uh, he is a clinical professor of surgery here. Uh, he's affiliated with countless organizations. Uh, he's peer reviewed over 30 publications uh, and has presentations and seminars that are over 160 of them. Uh, he has been prolific in his uh, delivery of care uh, and is still uh, practicing with melanoma uh, care in, in Wheeling. Uh, he was telling me last night that uh, for a while, uh, he and Dr. Kappel were the uh, uh, transplant, uh, extremity transplant surgeons of West Virginia, uh, and did that for many, many years until they just got tired, I guess. Uh, they did a, a, a full arm replantation in 1979, I think he told me, uh, and has been uh, prolific in his, uh, in his care of patients. Uh, in his commitment to the university uh, and to this department. <clears throat> and he is now heavily involved with the health plan of the Upper Ohio Valley as on the board of directors, which has been significant to the support of our fresh tissue training program and support of development of our lab on this campus, uh, which we're really excited to, to see to fruition, hopefully within the next uh, calendar year. Uh, so it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Pollock uh, as our uh, Morton lecturer for this year. Can you hear me? I need to put your mic on. I did. Is it, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Professor March. Professor Bergstrom, Professor Udich, Professor Kletzig, I thank you for the privilege of this podium. The only thing that I can tell you is I'm old. I have done nothing to deserve this honor. I'm not famous, I'm not rich, I drove down here in my 2007, what Capo calls jalopy, with a ripped seat, a ripped dashboard, 
and I'm too damn stupid to figure out how to get to this conference room as many times as I've been here. So Dr. Borgstrom and Linda, who has been here for 36 years, have to guide me to the conference room. That having been said, I hope you'll give me a little break. I wanna first begin with a quote with the Scottish philosopher, Carly, Thomas Carlyle. He stated in his critical and miscellaneous essays published in 1838, the one on history, that history is the essence of innumerable biographies. I'm going to first talk about Morton. Donald Morton, as the preamble said, was born in Richwood, West Virginia. How many of you know where Richwood, West Virginia is? A handful. Richwood, West Virginia in 2010 census had about 2000 people. Aaron, is it any bigger? It's small. The tragedy in Richwood was about 10 years ago, the little critical access hospital closed where Aaron's grandfather, Dr. Clemente Diaz, was sort of the backbone of that community. What is the community known for? Mainly for the annual ramp festival. And now Morgan, where are you Morgan? I saw you come in. Morgan and Aaron will be preparing ramp banquets for each of you. You just need to call for a reservation because they know, to, know how to cook them with ham on the side. Morton educational background has been revealed to you. A few things that he was graduated from the University of California in San Francisco in 1958. In 1960, he began with the National Cancer Institute. He worked from 1960 to 2005 on his monomania, which was to develop a vaccine to cure melanoma. Needless to say, it never did work. But in that pathway, beginning in the 1970s, he talked about sentinel node technology. It was described in his obituary in 2014. It was sort of by his description, like a mountain stream. Water runs down the mountain, then into the first lake. And the first lake catches the majority of the water, then the second and the third and the fourth. He called that node the sentinel node or the node that watches all others. This concept was pretty revolutionary. I didn't start doing sentinel nodes till 1999. Sentinel node technology was established by the MLST one trial, which he started in the 1990s, completed in 2014 when it was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And it said, indeed, sentinel node technology is a valid concept. What did this mean? Prior to that time, people were doing completion of node dissections. It reduced the morbidity and it's estimated it saved between three and $4 billion a year in our healthcare system. Some of the other things that he accomplished was to get into the pocket of John Wayne. Do you all know who John Wayne is, the Duke? Do any of you, are you all too young to know who he was? Anyway, he died in 1979, if you don't, I understand that. Linda knows who John Wayne was. He was a famous cowboy. Uh, John Wayne's family, when he died of gastric cancer, he had been treated by Donald Morton and they gave money to form John Wayne Cancer Center at UCLA. This existed until the mid nineties when he moved to Santa Monica, California and it became the John Wayne Cancer Institute. It was at the John Wayne Cancer Institute. Doesn't work, Linda. Okay. Am I allowed to stand here? Yeah. Sure. Sure. 
He just got pulled for a stupid one. No, it's not really. Yeah, so, yeah. It was at the John Wayne Cancer Institute that he trained this character. I understand, Linda, you showed a picture of him in 1980s costume. Uh, Capo worked with him. You worked with him, Rick. He was an all-time character, ranking just slightly below David Fogarty. But uh, <laughs> Lee Fojag, we worked with him. He did his last three years of general surgery here at WVU. Then he went and worked at the John Wayne Cancer Institute where he was trained as a fellow. And he is now the program director of the fellowship. Morton trained over a hundred fellows. He also wrote 600 publications. And Lee Foshag then, He got this. He was the program chief, and you all know Dr. Kledzenker. If you don't, she works here. <laughs> I'm stuck again. I'm a computer Luddite. <clears throat> this is the title that I have plagiarized from William Mallon, who wrote the most comprehensive biography of Ernest A. Codman. How many of you have ever heard of Ernest A. Codman? You have heard of it. Ernest A. Codman, I really had never heard of, but I'll tell you a little bit more about this later and how West Virginia collaborated to do the right thing. Now, I'm going to give this talk in collaboration with Rick Vaughn, and you'll understand a little bit better when we get to the end. I have nothing to disclose. Uh, there are occasional quippets and dates that I plagiarize from the internet. This is the bulletin of the American College of Surgeons. It came out in April of 2012. I read an article there by Lamar McGinnis, who was the president of the American Cancer Society and also president of the American College of Surgeons. More on that later. This is Ernest Codman. I owe a lot of credit to the Francis A. Countway Library at Harvard Medical School there rare books and manuscripts who provided this photograph on the left, which is the earliest known photograph of Codman. The one, the second one, it was a, from a Boston Brahmin family. And as happened in those days, when you were old enough to be weaned, you went off to boarding school. He was in the third grade when his parents sent him to boarding school. He was at the Fay School, in Southboro, Massachusetts, for a total of three years through the sixth grade. He then went to St. Mark's, which is still in business, which is described as the proper place for a young person interested in medicine and the sciences. A Mr. A. Alford, uh, when Bill Mallon was writing a biography of Codman, said, that he was fastidious, meticulous, attention to detail, popular, but odd, quixotic, very bright, and had a very questioning mind, which was irritating as hell to people in 19th century high school. Fast forward, here he is in 1891, when he was graduated from Harvard College, cum laude, and given a dual scholarship to attend the Harvard Medical School. 
This is his best friend. How many of you have heard of this guy? Okay. Harvey Williams Cushing descri described Codman as bright, quick, full of energy, worked 14 hours a day, where Codman confessed that, where Cushing confessed that, in fact, he got kind of woozy after about three hours with Codman. The two of them, Harvey Williams Cushing and Ernest A. Codman, came up with what was a revolutionary discovery at that time called the ether chart. Does anyone know what the ether chart was? Ben, you don't know? The ether chart was this eureka discovery that when we're putting patients to sleep for general anesthesia, maybe we should mark down their blood pressure. Until that point in time, never was a patient's blood pressure or vital sign ever recorded. As a matter of fact, they didn't even keep medical records. All the, all the history of the patient was in the head of the surgeon. God forbid the surgeon go out and get hit by a bus. Uh, there, there was no record for these patients. I have to tell a little personal story. When I was a general surgery resident, one of our attendings was Harvey Cushing's last resident. And I will never forget Dr. Lee Kendall because he made us clamp and tie every vessel with spool cotton. How many of you have ever used cotton in the operating room? Probably, yeah. Dr. Dr. Marsh remembers that, but every bleed, we didn't use a cautery for anything. It was just forbidden. Now I have a young associate, she cauteries everything. So things have changed. Harvey Williams Cushing, after finishing at the medical school at Harvard in the same year, 1895, with Ernest A. Codman went on to study with the venerable William Stuart Halstead at Johns Hopkins. It has been alluded to that surgical training has changed dramatically through the years, but the surgical program that you're in today is probably designed somewhat after the, the Hopkins method of William Stuart Halstead. The only exception is if you were a resident of William Stewart Halstead, you might be there if you're lucky 12 years, if not 15, because Halstead thought or that everybody should be trained in every discipline. And thus Harvey Williams Cushing became the father of neurosurgery uh, in and out of a general surgery residency. And that's a topic for a whole other day, but. He and Halstead did not get along, so out he went, and he became professor of surgery to the newly opened Peter Bent Brigham Hospital in Boston in 1910. The only thing I had ever heard about Codman was Codman's triangle, which in sarcomas of the bone, there's periosteal bone formation, and it lifts the periosteum <laughs> off in this little triangle is created. Now, after 1895, during his medical school experience, Codman had gone in his, four, in his third year of medical school to Vienna and studied at the Vulture Clinic, where he became very interested in the shoulder, the supraspinatus tendon and subacromial bursa. After returning to Boston, he studied under the venerable F.B. Harrington. Um, residencies at that time were non-existent. If you wanted to be a surgeon, you studied under a mentor. I would say, you said my whole life is in Wheeling. That is true. That's because my grandfather, who was born in Greene County, Pennsylvania, went to the Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia. And upon graduation, he spent two to three years with John Blair Deaver. Have you ever heard of John Blair Deaver? Have you ever held a retractor? 
that's John Blair Beaver. And my grandfather then came to Wheeling where he practiced medicine starting in 1914. His son thereafter and me, and we all used the same desk to see patients for 107 years. That having been said, I can remember growing up that my grandfather would see patients with a sore throat, take their tonsils out in the office, deliver their baby. If they broke their hip, nail their hip. And if they needed a gastrectomy, do the gastrectomy. Now, this was the sort of thing that Codman railed against. He said, nobody can be an expert in everything. We need to specialize in what we do. So he specialized after learning of German Dr. Wilhelm Rinken's x-ray. And what Rinken had done was take the English developed Crookes tube, hooked it up to a current. There was some barium paper on the table and he noticed that a shadow was created. And he thought this must be x-radiation. And the teaching point with this is in medicine, so many things have been discovered by the power of observation. Cephalosporins, inhibitory ring in the sewers of Sardinia. Alexander Fleming, inhibitory ring on a pit petri dish. William Rankin saw a shadow on a piece of paper, but he took it to the next step and researched it and developed it. How many of you walk by a chestnut tree each day and you don't know it's a chestnut tree? Powers of observation. There are many things, young people, to be discovered in medicine. You think it's all been done. We've only just begun. We've only just begun. But just, just observe what's around you. Codman got married in 1899 to Katie Bowditch. More about her later. Now, this is the key to his monomania. In 1910, he attended the Society for Clinical Surgery in London. And on the cab ride back, which took about 45 minutes, he was in the cab with Dr. Edward Martin. Edward Martin was the Barton Professor of Surgery at the hospital at the University of Pennsylvania. He had had this notion that the Clinical Congress of Surgeons should have some sort of a mission. Well, the mission that was presented to him in that cab ride back was the idea of Codman. Codman said, we need to look at end results and standardize hospital care and safety in America. Well, Edward Martin just flew with that idea. It became the mission of the American <clears throat> College of Surgeons to establish the end result. The end result is if you treat a patient and you get a good result, what did you do right? And if you treat a patient and you get a lousy result, what did you do wrong? So critically looking at one's own practice became a mission for the American College of Surgeons. Okay, let's review all of this. In 1910, the Clinical Congress. In 1911, Edward Martin was elected president. He was from Hospital University of Pennsylvania. He appointed two committees, organization under Franklin Martin and standardization under Codman. In 1913, the American College of Surgeons was born. Then there was an actual development of the Committee on Substandardization. They had worked on that from 1912 to 1917. Needless to say, it wasn't very popular. In 1932, the West Virginia chapter was formed. In 1937, remember in the early 19th century, there was no American Board of Surgery exam. People just went and they studied with a mentor and they came out and they hung out a shingle and did it all. And the American College of Surgeons was the, the 
hatching point for hospital standardization programs and became the Joint Commission in 1953. How many of you realize that the surgeons are the one that started the standardization of hospitals? Okay, so you've learned something, Ben. Ben was just in the ATLS instructor class. I said, all I care about is you remember one thing. Remember that the American College of Surgeons started the Joint Commission. This is Edward Martin. He was the president. Now, this is an interesting character. This is Franklin Martin. He was in charge of organization. And as far as I can tell, he was a brilliant organizer. He died in 1935. As you recall, the college was established in 1913. He was the, we were talking about the Patricia Turner or David Hoyt. But on the right is the key to his success, Eleanor K. Grimm. She ran the American College of Surgeons. And when he died in 1935, Eleanor Grimm took over the College of Surgeons as the director. She's the one that communicated between the regents and the staff, the American College, and subsequently to the members. Now, in Norwald and Kernahan's book in 2012, The History of the First Hundred Years of the American College of Surgeons, they say that Franklin Mar Martin was a bit of a I, I want to say he was a, a businessman. Uh, he owned the journal SGNO. I can remember growing up surgery, gynecology, and obstetrics. He was the owner of it, which he somehow worked a deal to get the American College of Surgeons to buy it from him. Uh, so he was a little bit questionable in terms of his ethical background, but no one ever questioned the <clears throat> ethics of Ernest Codman. Now I'll turn to Boston. James Michael Curley is a very famous Boston politician. This is him in the silk stockings and the treffle hat and the waistcoat. What is this about? This is what he showed up in the 1935 graduation of Harvard College. Well, the marshals were a little bit upset with him showing up looking like a clown. And he whipped out a copy of the Massachusetts Bay Treaty and said, this is the proper dress as has been instructed by this treaty. The rest of you are underdressed for this occasion. And of course that got huge wave graves from his constituency, which was the South Boston Irish Catholic constituency. He was mayor of Boston several times, governor of Massachusetts, elected to Congress twice from prison. Okay, now here's where we start with the rest of the story. In January of 2015, Ernest A. Codman organized as president of the Suffolk Medical Society, which is the county that Boston is in a meeting starting at 8.15 at night with a schedule of six speakers. I can't imagine anything worse at eight o'clock at night to sit through six speeches. Well, Curley was the first speaker. He got up and he talked about the role of politics in handling uh, healthcare. I have to go back and look at my script here, make sure I don't get too far ahead. And the last speaker was Ernest A. Codman. And he got up and he unfurled this. As you'll notice, his friend Philip Hale, who is a famous Boston Impressionist artist, designed this, the Back Bay Golden Goose Ostrich. The head is stuck in the sand, eating humbugs. The rear end is a goose, and the goose is throwing out golden eggs. Down in the left-hand corner are all the Harvard faculty catching the golden eggs. 
basically the moral of this was there's a lot of money in medicine and the trustees did not know whether they could continue to run their hospital unless they had the money that was being charged by the surgeons who were forbidden to admit that they ever made a mistake. Well, Godwin would have no part of that. Needless to say, he dis described distinguished old professors leaving with their heads bowed, young people getting up and really didn't have much to say. And there were a few that come up, came up and shook his hand. But the overall impression was, how dare you talk about money? How dare you talk about quality in healthcare? These were forbidden topics at the time. On January 18th, these are the headlines that appeared in the Boston papers. Uh, everybody agreed that he was right, but they thought his judgment was a little bit flawed by showing that cartoon. That cartoon has become quite famous. It's framed in the history of medicine library at Harvard. Now, what was Codman about? He had five simple rules. Each hospital should have a medical staff. The medical staff should be chosen based on graduation from medical school. The physicians must demonstrate competency and character. Have you all heard of the Flexner report? What'd you hear about it? Yeah, Abraham Flexner was at the University of Louisville and in 1910, he got up and said, there are a lot of these medical schools that are really crappy. Uh, we need to shut them down. And there was a nationwide surge to work on competency for physicians because prior to that time, they were taking anybody and turning out anybody. Medical records should be written and filed. As I said earlier, until that time, the medical record was in the head, head of the doctor. And each hospital should have a clinical laboratory and radiology section. Indeed, Codman had become the first radiologist at Boston Children's Hospital. He was a skiographer or reader of x-rays. And Harvey Williams Cushing said in 1890, 1895, when he went to Hopkins, there was no x-ray. When I grew up, there were no CAT scans. We had, we had very enemas and a bone box. Right, Capel? Yeah, on a good day. We, we didn't have all the stuff. As I say now in trauma, it's like, don't even look at the patient, just send them for a CAT scanogram. Uh, get everything you possibly can CAT scanned. Times have changed. Now, in Ann Reverby's biography of Codman, she said there were only three hospitals in the United States that subscribed to the end result. What, what we're doing, why we're doing it, what are the effects of our treatment, and do we present a quality product? The three hospitals were Women's Hospital in New York, Women's and Children's in Boston, which became part of the Brigham. And the third was the Ohio Valley General Hospital in Wheeling, West Virginia. Everything sort of rotates back in this talk to West Virginia. What contributions did Codman make? Sarcoma registry. He basically said that anybody can do an amputation, but do you know what you're doing? He thought that blood good and Ewing and Mallory were the only people besides him that knew why to amputate for a sarcoma. So he started a registry to educate going forward as to who is competent and who is not competent to treat patients with sarcoma. His other contribution was the shoulder. He described bursitis when he came back from studying in Vienna. And he was shown, nobody had ever heard of bursitis, but I can tell you, I had bursitis one time. Doesn't hurt at all unless you move. Uh, but I had to go out to Capels on a Sunday and said, please shoot me right here because I can't move my arm. 
That's not good for a surgeon. Well, three things I know in life, taxes, change, and death. And this is what happened to Ernest Codman at 71 years old. What did he do? Established the anesthesia record. He introduced x-rays. He introduced the concept of a radiolo radiologist working with Walter Bradford Cannon. He did the first GI series. He talked about using barium to look at the elementary track. This was never really done until 1911. He said you can get cancer from x-ray. He talked about the Collie's fracture. This had been described in the 18th century, but he demonstrated the use of X-ray in evaluating wrist fractures. The end results, the ACF Joint Commission, the importance of clinical records, the importance of evidence-based surgery based on a series. He stated to his colleagues at the Mass General Hospital that cryo, in Cleveland and Will Mayo in Minnesota are getting ahead of us because they're presenting these scientifically valid studies. We need to stop using anecdote and put together valid studies. He talked about specialization in surgery. He would have put my grandfather out of business. He talked about sarcomas, the shoulder, and the core competencies, four of which were his. We were talking last night at dinner about the ACGME core competencies. You will see that of these competencies, four of them were Codman's ideas. You all know about the core competencies. If you don't, you should, because the Residency Review Committee certainly knows about them, right, David? Okay, here's the rest of the story. Come up here, Rick. I showed you the bulletin of the American College of Surgeons. I have my watch here because Rick threatened me with death if I wasn't finished in 45 minutes. So that's why we're doing this. And I thank you so much for being here, Rick. This is Lamar McGinnis, the 90th president of the American College of Surgeons. In the 2012, I showed you the front of the bulletin of the American College. In referring to Codman, he said, I'm hoping that the Joint Commission, the American Cancer Society, the American College of Surgeons, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons should erect a headstone at the grave site to properly acknowledge this visionary and our debt to him on our centennial, it should be 2013 would be a perfect time for this. You need to understand that Codwin was so shunned because of his revolutionary ideas. He died in poverty. His wife could not even afford. He got buried in the Bowditch family plot. I showed you her earlier, but there is no marker for his grave. I read this and it said, well, the American College of Surgeons, that's us, we're the West Virginia chapter. I was going to give a talk in May. And for some reason, I had seen my aunt who lived in Morgantown and she gave me a Huntington Bank ball cap. Well, I'm not a ball cap wearer. Anyway, I don't know why it was in the car. I brought it in with me and it suddenly occurred to me, why don't we do something? I feel terrible about this great man not being recognized. So we then, you're on. <clears throat> you want to change the slides? Okay. Right. So like Dr. Pollock said, uh, the main meeting of the West Virginia chapter of the American College of Surgeons met at the Greenbrier <clears throat> in 2012. And Dr. Pollock passed the hat. He gave a talk, talked about the things that you just heard, all of the things that this man did. Any one would be exceptional, but you look at that list of all the things he accomplished, all the things that still affect us today. The fact that we have an M&M &M conference every week is based on problems. 
<coughs> the EMR that everybody loved, that was Cosmo, the Joint Commission. So everything that we do on a daily basis directly goes back to what we did. So any one of those things would be exceptional. That list would be just unheard of today. And yet he died penniless, like he said, could not afford put a headstone. They're not even sure where he is buried within the plot of his wife's family. Now you notice that Dr. McGinnis said the Joint Commission, the American College of Surgeons, the shoulder, the orthopedics, somebody else to get together and put up a headstone for Dr. Cotton. <clears throat> Dr. Pollock took it upon himself, brought in the hat, passed it around at the meeting, at the end of the meeting. And, you know, if you think so, please put it in a book or two, $5, $10. It turns out we raised over $1,000 at that meeting. That was the meeting where I was installed as president for the year for the American, or for the Western chapter. I was also chair of this department at the same time. The administrator of the West Virginia chapter happened to be my secretary. <clears throat> so it fell upon Karen Bartholomew, who was the administrator, my secretary, and myself to try to figure out what are we going to do with this thousand dollars with Dr. Pollock raised by passing a baseball hat around the crowd. <clears throat> so we contacted the American College of Surgeons headquarters in Chicago, and they said, I got no idea. <clears throat> we, we don't know what you're talking about. So we actually sent them a check. They held on to the check so long that the bank called and said, they not cashed your check. What do you want us to do? You want us to just you know, send the money back or what? So Sharon and myself kept bugging the guys in Chicago. You got to do something. You, you want to you want to put up a headstone. So eventually, I stepped down as chair the next year. Dr. Nakayama became the chair. He knew the higher up of the ATS much better than I did, and he took up the uh, the fight and kept pushing. To get a headstone. They finally cashed the check, talked to the Joint Commission, talked to the American Cancer Society, the Shoulder Society, the uh, surgeons in Boston who had shunned Dr. Codman when he was there, and eventually said, Yes, yeah, we agree, we're going to put up a headstone. The um, initially, they wanted, well, I won't say they. Dr. McGinnis said, well, this was my idea. I want credit. <laughs> you know, I'm the one who said you should raise the money. He didn't say he was going to raise the money. Somebody should raise the money and put up a headstone. <laughs> so <clears throat> they eventually got an architect and came up with a headstone but they didn't want to give us any credit at all. So Dr. Nakayama wasn't going to take that. <clears throat> he kept pushing them and said, we started it. We got the initial money. You're going to give us credit. So there was a service in Boston at the Auburn Cemetery where he was buried. And these were the list of speakers to honor Dr. Codman at the presentation of his headstone. Dr. Hoyt was the executive director of the ACS. He's actually been here. Dr. McGinnis, who 
talked more about himself and his own accomplishments than <coughs> that of Dr. Codman. Dr. Warshaw, who's also been a guest here. <coughs> and you can see way down here at the bottom, Dr. Pollock <coughs> was given an opportunity to stand before the crowd and say, yes, you were actually the one who started this whole thing. So, thing I remember about this was it was in July. It was about 95 degrees. <coughs> Everybody was sweating. Uh, we were supposed to have, I think, five to 10 minute talk. Um, I think Dr. Hendren talked for 45 minutes. Forever. <laughs> Forever, <laughs> while people were passing out. So, <clears throat> so here's the small crowd that attended with the uh, speakers. <clears throat> I'm over there in the corner somewhere. <clears throat> Since I had been the president, uh, Dr. Pollock invited me to come along and join the, uh, the presentation. <clears throat> you can see here's the headstone, here are the speakers, here's Dr. Pollock. So what it says, Ernest Codman, born 1869, died 1940. Father of Outcomes Assessment, Quality Measurement, and Healthcare, <clears throat> which has uh, changed the way that healthcare is delivered. One of the quotes that he had was, it may take a hundred years for my ideas to be accepted. And he wasn't too far wrong. <clears throat> so he died in 1940, but his initial concept of the Outcomes Hospital which was a hospital that he built, he started where the outcomes of all the patients were made public. So this went against everything in Boston. The hospital lasted about 10 years before it uh, <clears throat> became financial problems and that sort of stuff. So it took almost a hundred years, but you look at that list of accomplishments, the American College of Surgeons, Tumor Registry, the Joint Commission, m and Conference, all of that is because of Dr. Codman and his foresight, which was widely panned at the time that he was uh, proposing all of those. So we owe a great debt to this man, even though very few people know who he is. So the headstone shows our gratitude to the donors. You see the Joint Commission, Mass General Physicians, who, who kicked him out when he was there. The American Shoulder and Elbow Society because of his book on the shoulder. The American Hospital Association. And last and best, West Virginia chapter of the American College of Surgeons. This was in the uh, ACS bulletin and in the news releases. Interesting, when you go and look at the Joint Commission's comments, the Massachusetts General Physicians' comments, and the American Shoulder Society, we don't show up on their news releases. <clears throat> so, so that's our contribution to the history of Dr. Codman. I'll turn it back over to Dr. Pollock. I got to be on time, Rick. I want to end with a comment, a quote from Donna Bedian, Masters of Public Health, very famous person in terms of quality outcomes.
I intended to summon from the shadowy past, someone who should have been recognized always as a towering figure in the history of our field. I hope to celebrate the man making amends in my small way for the neglect he so long unjustly suffered. The end result idea led him to disgrace, notoriety, isolation, and near financial ruin. It also set him, as I hope to show, on a road to immortality in his views of the nature of the hospital, of its social responsibility, and of its accountability to the more exigent public. Codman seems more of a man of our time than of his. Thank you all for being a very attentive audience, and I'll roll the credits. And thanks to my co-presenter, Rick Vaughn, couldn't have been done more perfectly. We have time for a couple of questions, if anyone has any. <laughs>